Amen. I don't have the sign up, but I think Children's Church is dismissed. Is there a Children's Church today? Never mind. Stay here. Don't you dare get up. Sit down. Thank you for that terrified look. <laughs> that was great. It would have been fine. Just let them go, you know, run around. So, uh... Last week we talked about uh, how a person is justified before God and um, today we're going to go a little bit further into that, not justification, but what we do with that justification and I have to warn you that it's a little bit heavy today so um, buckle up for uh, just some things that are not easy to hear and maybe you'll disagree with me and it'll be great, we'll have a fight, it'll be awesome. So I'm going to try to... Um, really front end load this message with grace because you need to understand that it all begins with grace right it all starts with grace wherever we go from here we have to understand that we respond to what God has done for us so I was reading about this uh, youth ministry major who was at college and was finishing one of his final finals it was a class called youth issue issues <laughs> it's easy for me to say uh, when he got to the class he was kind of hurried because he hadn't had enough time to study he wasn't sure that he would be able to you know get the grade that he wanted to get and so he's trying to quickly study for it and he sat down and when he sat down uh, the professor got up there and said here's what we're going to do we're going to go through the study guide and just sort of talk a little bit about some of the things that are going to be on the test and they began to do that and he began to go back and forth but then he started to cover things that weren't on the material that he'd passed out. And they started to complain and they're like, wait a minute, this isn't on the test. This shouldn't be on the test. We didn't know any of this. And he said, well, it's in your book. So you're required to know whatever's in the book. And so when I pass this test out, you're going to have to take it. But here's the instructions. When you get the test, make sure you leave it face down until everybody has received a test. And at the same time, we'll turn them over and we will take the test together. So they passed it out and all the sheets were on their face and on his signal, they turned him over. And to their absolute delight, every single one of the students saw that every question was answered. All of the questions on the quiz, on the test, on the final were answered. And they were very excited to see this, no doubt. One of them looked and thought, well, maybe... Maybe I got the teacher's edition, and that would be great. But then he looked around, and everybody had the same goofy, you know, smile on their face because they had all received the same instructions. And the professor said this. He said, this is the end of the final exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you get an A. You have just experienced grace. So he went around the room and he started looking at all the students and he asked them individually, what is your grade? Do you deserve the grade you're receiving? How much studying did you do for the exam that helped you on this final? And they answered those questions. But the goal for the whole thing is what he finished by saying. He said, I have tried to teach you all semester that you are a recipient of grace. I've tried to communicate to you that you need to demonstrate this gift as you work with young people. Don't hammer them. They're not the enemy. Help them, for they will carry on your ministry if it is full of grace. We want to be a church that proclaims the grace of God. How is a person justified before a holy God? Perfection, right? You can't do it on your own. It's impossible. So God has provided his salvation to all of us as a free gift. And this should be something that we celebrate. This should be something that would cause us to weep as we sing songs about that he paid it all for me. That I couldn't do it. That there's not enough goodness in me to pay for what God has done for me. And this should cause us to, to bow our, our heads and to bend our knees and to say, God, you're worthy of my praise. I don't deserve it, but I thank you for your grace 
And I pray that the rest of your lives you will spend investigating what grace is all about because it's huge. Lewis Ferry Schaefer was the founder of a place called Dallas Theological Seminary. He taught uh, this, this concept of grace through all of his days at Dallas. On his final lecture, by this time he was an 82-year-old man and he was continually teaching on grace. And this is what happened in that final class. After spending all of his life, all of his adult years telling young men about God's grace. He said this, the aging professor who taught that particular sem sem semester from a wheelchair mopped the perspiration from his b brow. Now once, not, no one in the class moved as he finished the, se the session. It was as though the young theologians were basking in what they had heard awestruck with their professor's insights and enthusiasm about God's matchless grace. The gray-haired gentleman rolled his chair to the door and as he flipped off the light switch, the class broke out in spontaneous and thunderous applause. As the beloved theologian wiped tears from his head, or from his eyes and bowed his head, he lifted one hand to gesture them to stop. He had one closing remark as he looked across the room with a great smile. Amidst the deafening silence, he spoke softly and he said this. He said, gentlemen, for over half of my life, I have been studying this truth and I am just beginning to scratch the surface. I'm just beginning to discover what the grace of God is all about. His whole life has been about preaching grace. <laughs> but the more you know about it, the more you go, I don't understand it. Because God's grace is huge. How is a person justified before a holy God? In a word, grace. God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. This is how we are justified. But we cannot take that lightly. We cannot just say, oh great, I got my fire insurance paid for. I'm going to go to heaven so I can live any way that I please. No. We have to be grateful for what God has done for us and say, Lord, now that you have offered to me salvation, the least I can do is offer you my life in return. The least I can do. We have cheapened grace so much in the church of Jesus Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this in a book called The Cost of Discipleship. He said, we have cheapened grace and cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting for costly grace. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. That's so good. Such grace is costly because it costs a man his life and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Costly grace is the living word, the word of God. Costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. He finishes by saying grace is costly because it compels, 
It compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. And it is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, salvation happens in a moment. Discipleship happens for the rest of your life. Salvation costs you nothing. Discipleship costs you everything. Salvation occurs momentarily. Discipleship takes a lifetime. Salvation is something that God does for us. And discipleship is something that we do with God. The problem is that many preach only a life of decision and not a life of discipleship. We start with a decision and then we move on to discipleship. But I want you to know right away that God loves you, that he's purchased your salvation and that this gift is bigger than anything that your mind can imagine. And so he turns and he says, now, what are you gonna do with it? How will you respond to it? And as we open up the scriptures today, we find something incredibly challenging. And if you read it wrongly, you're going to see it not for what it's worth. So I want to be careful that you understand what we're talking about. So if you have your Bibles, go to Luke. Luke chapter 14, great passage of scripture. 25 to 35 is where we're going to be. So get the picture. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's not long on this earth. He'll be crucified soon. And large crowds were traveling with Jesus and, and turning to them, he said. Now, 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 here's the picture, okay? Always large crowds followed him. And what they wanted, what they wanted was bread. What they wanted was a circus. They loved the food that he provided. They loved the show that he put on. How about another miracle, Jesus? How about turning water into wine and multiplying fish and bread? They loved that and they were there. And I think Jesus was like, okay, I'm fixing to thin the crowd. <laughs> so large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. And if anyone, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not First, sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it. For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he can, with 10,000 men, oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, if, if he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. He kind of turns a page. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now let me ask, does any, everybody have ears today? Just checking. So this is for you. You got ears, this is for you. Jesus is speaking truth to you and to me. Now listen, there's something you've got to understand. Reading this passage, I even put it up on the notes so you'll understand. If you read this passage and you see it as your ticket, that is really dark. I don't know why that happened. It, ticket is the word. If when you read this passage, you see this as your ticket to salvation, 
you would be reading it wrongly. If you hear Jesus say, the only way to get to heaven is to do what I just told you to do. If you think that he's saying, this is your ticket to heaven, do, 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 <laughs> then you'd be reading it wrong. But if you see this as your testimony of salvation, you'll be reading it rightly. If you see this as something that says, I've got to do these things to get to heaven, then you're reading it wrong. But if you see it, that this is how I respond to what Jesus has done for me, then you're reading it rightly. This is the thing. Two things you have to understand about this passage. This is my opinion. So it may not be correct. I think it is. Jesus Christ was preaching before or after the cross. Before, right? So before the cross, it was the law. It was the Old Testament. Everything that he was saying really was law. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. What was he convincing these people? That they can't do it. The hard sayings of Jesus were not saying, do this so that you can inherit eternal life. He was saying, you can't do enough. That's what was so frustrating to so many people. That's why the rich young ruler walked away. He's like, I got to do that. I can't do that. That's why last week, the story of the good Samaritan so frustrated the lawyer because the good Samaritan was better than he was. And if that's how I get to, to heaven, then I'm in serious, serious trouble. So he's not saying you do this to earn your salvation. The other thing we have to understand is that when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the law. He came to offer grace. So I think this, I think that, I think that why people were so frustrated with Jesus is because he was preaching an impossible message. And I think he wanted to do that so that when he got to the cross and he could yell out at the top of his lungs, it is finished. That what he was saying was, you see, you can't do it, but I did it. It's by grace. This is what I lived my life for to convince you of this moment in my life. This is what he's talking about. So when we read this, understand that he's not talking about a, a ticket to heaven, but he's talking about a testimony for those that are going to heaven. So he's saying, if you know him, if you understand him, then this is how you ought to respond. So the, the title of the day, the sermon is, is all in. Well, what does it mean to be all in? It's a great question, isn't it? I don't play poker I have, but I don't currently. I'm not good at it. I don't think I would win anything. But I've learned a little something about poker. When a guy takes all of his chips and he says, I'm all in, what's he doing? He's saying this. He's saying, I believe that what I hold in my hand is better than what you hold in your hand. So I am real willing to risk all that I have for what I hold in my hand. He's all in. To me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I know beyond a shadow of doubt, we're talking in Sunday school about hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know that what's in my hand, or better yet, what's in my heart, is going to get me where I need to go. And so I can, I can give all of my life and say, I am all in because of what Christ has done for me. My response to the gospel is to say whatever you want. You guys have heard of this guy named Cortez, 1519, Spaniard, coming to Mexico with 600 men. His goal was to conquer the Mexicans. So they get to shore, and what does Cortez order to have happen? He turns to the ships and he says, burn the ships. We're not going back. We either defeat these guys or we die trying. If we defeat them, we'll take their ships back to Spain. But you guys, we are not turning around. We're going forward. The question is how? How is a person all in? 
And I know you're waiting for your notes to be fulfilled, so let me just put this up here. And I'm still going to answer the question. I'm not behind. You're just ahead, okay? So let me get there and, and we'll talk about it. We will talk about what it means to be all in. This is all introduction. You got to understand that much of it. So how, how does that happen? Because here's what I see. I've been a Christian for 30 some years, two, 32 years, and in my time following Jesus, do you know what I've seen? I've seen people come and go. I've seen people get all fired up about their faith and then they disappear as if nothing ever happened. Why? What's the deal? This is a difficult question for me. Well, it was a difficult question for another young man who came to one of his uh, mentors. This man had lived for Jesus for years and he was consistent in his faith. And so this younger man went up to this older man and said, the thing I notice about you is that your faith is real, that you've been following Jesus for a long time and you're not stopping. Why? How is it that people come and go but you are sticking it out? And this old man just sat back and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll answer that question by telling you a story. We love stories, don't we? Guy sits back in his lawn chair and he says, you see that dog of mine right there? I was sitting here several weeks ago and all of a sudden out of the blue this rabbit runs right past us. My dog saw it, jumped up and began to chase this dog, barking and howling and running and jumping everywhere he went. And pretty soon, several other dogs decided to join him. And there was a whole pack of dogs running after this rabbit. And they ran 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 and pretty soon... A couple dogs decided not to run anymore. Then a couple more, then a couple more, and pretty soon it was just my dog running after the rabbit. That's the answer to your question. He said, what? I don't understand what you're talking about. He said, the reason you don't understand what you're talking about is because you didn't ask the right question. The question is, why did those other dogs stop running after the rabbit? And the answer is because my dog was the only one that saw the rabbit. Everybody else saw the dog running after the rabbit. The dog that I own saw the rabbit. And I think that's the point for so many people. So many people look at other Christians running after Jesus. And they think that would be great and they start. But they don't really understand what it means to follow him. And when times get hard, when things don't go the way they want, they begin to stop following and they go back to the way they were. And I think there's some truth to that. I think there are people who maybe aren't really authentic in their walk with Christ because I don't know that they've really seen him for who he is. I think there are people that just simply exist on the coattails of somebody else. You know, I've said this before and I'll say it again, kids, grown up in church, I fear for you. I fear for you because your parents saw the rabbit and you just see your parents chasing it. But some of you don't know Jesus. You just see what's going on. You don't know why you're here today. Somebody asks you, why do you believe what you believe? Your, your answer is, well, because my parents taught me that. Really? Is that, is that it? I would encourage you to pursue Christ. See him for yourself, not for somebody else. Don't follow me. Please don't follow me. Find Jesus and follow him. So then what does that look like according to Jesus? I'll answer it in three simple, huh, easy but not simple answers. How do, you, how do you become all in? What does that mean? It means an abandonment of your past priorities. Listen to what Jesus says. If anyone comes after me, comes to me, Listen to this. And does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. When I was a youth pastor, I taught this passage and that night I received a phone call 
from a mother. <laughs> she said, how come you told my daughter to hate me? I said, I didn't say that. Pay attention, lady or child. I didn't say that. I said, as it compares to how you love Jesus, it will appear as if you hate your parents. This is how much you love him. The word hate is really, could be translated to love less. The Bible talks about how one person loved this person but hated the other. It usually means they didn't hate them, but they loved the other one to such an extent that it only appeared the other way around. And what Jesus is saying is that if anyone would come after me, uh, he, would, he, would, he, would, he would hate his father and mother in that sense. If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and his mother, if anyone comes after me and he doesn't carry his own cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. What is he saying here? Four quick words. He's saying abandonment of stuff, self, society, and the system. It's all inside of there somehow. The stuff, the things that, you know, we think are so incredibly important. The self, my, I love myself more than I love anybody. And a lot of times I love myself more than I love God. The society are those people that are around you. The, the people that, you know, we call peers. The people that set what is cool and what isn't cool. And the system, the whole messed up cosmos that we live in. That's what we ought to abandon because that stuff is fallen and that stuff is broken and that stuff is passing away. But you know what the problem is? Is we tend to make gods out of things. Some of you parents have made really beautiful gods out of your children. But you know what? Children are great but they make lousy idols. You don't need to worship them. But don't feel alone in that. Remember Abraham and Isaac? Remember that God had promised Abraham this child? And Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed. They're like, we're, we're too old to have children. Do you understand how old we are? Like 190, it's not gonna happen. Well, as time went on, she found out she was pregnant. You know what they named the child? Isaac. You know what Isaac means? <laughs> laughter are you serious they laughed at God oh there's no way this is ever going to happen what are you going to name him <laughs> I think we'll just name him laughter this is hilarious I cannot believe that God did this every day Isaac lived with that name hey laughter come here hey you're a joke come here <laughs> it's the way it is well what happened with his dad is his dad his dad loved his son. Loved him to such a degree that he became an idol. And so God says to him, you know your son, Isaac, your only son? Yeah. I want you to take him and I want you to sacrifice him. You want me to what? I want you to take him up and I want you to sacrifice him. You want me to kill my son? That's right. Okay takes his son, takes some servants and they go and they stop at the bottom of the mountain and he turns to his servants and said, the boy and I are going to go up and we're going to worship God and we're going to come back. I think he thought, maybe I'm going to kill my son but we're going to raise him from the dead somehow. But I'm going to be obedient. He goes up. His son says, where is the sacrifice, dad? I see the wood, I see the fire but I don't see the sacrifice. Um, God will provide he gets him up there, puts him on the altar, tells him what God has demanded of him, brings the knife down to the jugular vein, getting ready to slit his son's throat. And God stops him and says, okay, just checking. Just wanted to make sure that you worshiped me and not your son because I'm the only one that can be worshiped. I'm the only one that's worthy and that was an incredible lesson learned that some of us do the same thing. Some of us worship our kids and our kids' activities. We follow them so much. A pastor was asked by another friend of his, he said, um, 
Let me ask you this. If you could choose one of these uh, for your kids, what would you choose? A Division I scholarship? A full ride scholarship because of uh, academics? Popularity among friends? Or a person who pursued Jesus with all of his heart? Which would you choose for your child? You know what the pastor said? Jesus Christ and a pursuit after him. The next question was, okay, can I ask you this? Where does your time go in those four areas? How much time do you spend helping your child pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ compared to academics, friends, and sports? And he had to be honest. Sports, friends, academics. Sports, friends, academics. Sports, friends, academics. And Sunday morning we go to church for an hour and a half. So what was your first answer? You want him to pursue Jesus. How much time are you spending doing that? It's a really, really convicting answer, isn't it? But it's true. What do you want more than anything? I want to see my kids in heaven. I want to see them walking with Jesus. What am I doing to make that happen? Pursue God. Don't make them your idol. He says you need to abandon all of that. Are you doing that? I pray that you are. I read an article this week that, um, man, it broke my heart. It broke my heart while simultaneously angering me. Have you ever had that happen to you? The title of the article was Evangelicals. Oh, by the way, what I'm about to say may cause some of you to leave this church and never come back. I hope that doesn't happen, but what I'm going to say is very controversial. I'm sorry, but this is what I believe. The article read, Evangelicals with Gay Children Challenging the Church. And the story says that what happened was these two people, Robert and Linda Robertson, were good Christians, came to a church a lot like ours, and their son came out as gay. And so they took him to counseling and they took him to the pastor and they prayed over him and, and, and all these things, but it just didn't work. And eventually he fought against them and went into a lifestyle that was absolutely opposed to what they believed. Got into drugs and eventually overdosed on drugs and died. And in the article, the woman says, now we realize how wrongly we were taught it's a horrible, horrible mistake that the church has made. Her words, not mine. She's saying, why can't you love God and love your kids no matter what they do? How come we can't compromise? How come we can't say, it's okay, they're just going to do things a little bit differently? How come we can't do that? Why do we have to stand so hard against things that are sinful? Especially this. And she began to accuse the church and saying the church needs to change. I want to tell you the church does not need to change. This is simply a prophecy that is coming to pass. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart for these guys. I can't imagine what that must be like. We pray for our kids. Oh Lord, please make them healthy. And then please, God, help them to love you and serve you with all their heart for the rest of their days. Oh, God, please. And I know that it doesn't always go well. Our kids sometimes do things that we wish they wouldn't do, and sometimes it goes to extreme measures. What do we do with that? Do we look to God and say, God, you need to change? Or God, I'm just going to have to deal with this. What do you do with a child who's living a rebellious life? Do you kick them out? No. You love them. You love them unconditionally. And you stand on the truth of Scripture. And you deal with that because it's going to happen. Allow me to read what Jesus said in regards to this probably. And some other things. A couple chapters back, Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this, Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? And my response is, yeah, 
<laughs> Aren't you the Prince of Peace? Yes, he is. But what did he come to bring peace Peace with us between his father. We are enemies. We become reconciled to him because of what he's done. Did he come to bring peace on the earth? If he did, he's failing miserably. He didn't come for that. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. No, I tell you, I will bring division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus is saying this is probably going to happen. Get ready for it. This is what's going to happen. But I'm not saying stop loving me. I'm just saying prepare for the inevitable. If you love Jesus... You're going to have trouble. Prepare for it. I don't like to say that. It breaks my heart. I can't imagine what it must be like. But some of you probably dealt with it this weekend. How did Thanksgiving go? You know what? It's good. I heard awesome. Way to go. That's pretty cool. You know, what happens? Because I've talked to some of you, you know, who have recently come to know Christ. And you go to a religious but lost family. And they're like, what is the deal with you? What happened to you? This is crazy. And families divide, right? Have you seen that happen? It's amazing how that happens. The gospel will divide. But Jesus says, give that stuff up. Ultimately, that stuff isn't what's going to matter. Pursue me and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple Bonhoeffer said this, the cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. To carry your cross means to be misunderstood. To carry your cross means to suffer. To carry your cross means to be ridiculed. To carry your cross means to die to yourself. Not a popular message, not an easy message, but we know it's true. The Apostle Paul said, but what was, what was to my profit, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which comes from the law, but a righteousness which is through faith in Christ. This is where it's found. So we must have an abandonment of our past priorities. Are we tracking it all? Are you paying it? Do you understand what I'm saying? I feel like I'm not hitting the nail at all. Are you guys listening to me? No, you don't have to clap. It's okay, but I'm just curious because I know this isn't easy to hear. I know it's not easy to hear, but we've got to abandon the things that mattered in our past, and I'm getting to an end point where you're going to go, yeah, I promise. Next, we must assess our present power. In other words, he's saying, now, if you're ready to do that, let me illustrate the point. And then he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost? Are you willing to pay the price, I guess? When you hear that first thing and you go, wow, that's pretty expensive. Now, the question is, am I willing to pay that? Am I willing to follow him at the expense of losing all things? Or do you just want it to be easy? I just want it to be easy. I just have to be honest with you. I do. I'm like these campers that showed up in the National Park Service and wrote comment cards. Listen to what they wrote in the comment section on the uh, suggestion box at some of these national parks. One, the trail needs to be reconstructed. <laughs> Please avoid building trails that go uphill. <laughs> That's awesome. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pests. Please uh, pave the trails. 
Chairlifts needed in some places. <laughs> The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. He said, is there any way I can get reimbursed for this? <laughs> Escalators would be good on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. And too many rocks in the mountains. Get rid of the rocks out of the Rockies. Seriously. This is what people are saying. And most of us are like, yeah, that's what I signed up for. Follow Jesus and it all goes great. You know what? Following Jesus may not end well for us. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first down and e sit down and estimate the cost? Some of us are like a woman who loves the idea of a wedding but hates the idea of a marriage. She says, I love to wear white. I look good in white. I like getting my photo taken. I have an affinity for cake. And it was nice to see everyone, but 50 years just seems like an awful long time. It's like a soldier who enlists in the army and says, I look good in green. And I like to hang out with the guys. And they give you a rifle. And they start shooting at you. I didn't sign up for this. Yes, you did. That's exactly what you signed up for. We just don't understand it. And he's saying, are you willing to pay that kind of price? Because if you're not, then what's going to happen is this. You're going to look like a fool and you're going to give the testimony of Jesus Christ a bad one. I remember when I was living in Washington, we were driving to the coast and I looked to my left and there are these three huge like nuclear towers, you know, the cooling silos. And I said, oh man, is this place nuclear powered? He said, no. Uh, they built that about 15 years ago, but they didn't have the money to finish it. So it's just empty. I said, you're kidding me. Everybody knows they couldn't finish a nuclear power plant and you drive by it and you see it all the time. Talk about an albatross of embarrassment. This is what Jesus is saying. You guys that start running and you stop. It's like a guy that didn't consider the cost. It's like a warrior who didn't consider what it was going to cost to fight this battle. You've got to make sure that you know whether or not that what you possess inside of you is enough to get you where you need to go. In all of my years following the Lord, I've seen way too many people who've walked away and their testimony for Christ is ruined. So we need to abandon our past priorities. We need to assess our present power. And then the third point, and this should tie it together, is we need an accurate and permanent perspective. Jesus says this, and it sort of sounds strange. He says, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Do you know, I know one thing about salt. You know what it is? It cannot lose its saltiness. That's what salt is. Salt is salty. That's why we call it salty, because it's salt. It's salty. You can't not be salt. You can't, it's impossible. I don't know what Jesus is talking about here except to say that only way to lose saltiness is to not be salt at all. In, in Jesus' day, they got the salt out of the Dead Sea. It wasn't these pure mines like we have it today. They had to get this stuff and it was all mixed with, with, with silica sand, a white sand that looks just like salt. And what would happen is the, 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 the water would get to the salt and dissolve it and the only thing that would be left would be sand. Sand isn't salty. It's awful. It's gritty. It doesn't work. It doesn't preserve. You and I, if we know Christ, we are salt. It's who we are. You can't change that. So what I'm saying is be who you are because that's who you are. We are salt. Salt can't lose its saltiness unless it's just diluted into nothingness. Marcus Luttrell, I don't know if you guys have ever read the book or seen the movie Lone Survivor. Marcus Luttrell is a Navy SEAL. 
He was born to be a Navy SEAL. Those guys are just different, aren't they? The stuff that they endure to be called a SEAL is amazing. In his book, he talks about this mission to go and to, uh, to, to find this guy and to kill him. And on their mission, if you read about it, if you saw the movie, you know that they were uh, found out and they were attacked by hundreds of Taliban, four guys against hundreds of Taliban. And in the process, three out of the four guys were killed. Marcus was the only one to survive. Here's what happened to him. He had a broken nose. He bit his tongue in half and swallowed it. He had to gag it back up to keep it. Uh, he was hit with an RPG, blown off the side of a mountain. When he woke up, he was paralyzed from his chest down. He'd been shot several times. His pelvis was broken. But he was a seal. And seals don't fight until they're dead. Then he said, I was going to fight until they killed me because this is who I am. After his back was broken and he was paralyzed from the chest down, he began to crawl to try to get to safety. He said, I took a rock and I drew a line in front of me and I crawled to that line. And then I took the rock and I drew another line and I crawled to that line. Seven miles he did that because he's a seal. It's who he is. You can't take that warrior mentality out of him. It's just who he is. And as a follower of Christ, this is who you are. There's no excuse. There's no saying, no, Lord, it doesn't work that way. So I thought, how do I illustrate this point? And I've done it before, and I'm just going to do it again to close it's my clothespin illustration. I think we do this because we have an eternal perspective. We live for Jesus when things get hard. We live for Jesus when everybody else says stop because we have an eternal perspective. Can I show you that? Most people think this. Most people believe that uh, they're born somewhere down here and they live this long life have kids, get married, get married and have kids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and they live and they live and they enjoy life and they do all this stuff and it's a long, long way from the cradle to the grave and maybe if you're lucky, 80 years later you die and it's all full of stuff. It's this huge thing and, and we live like we're Bon Jovi ro roadies who say, it's my life. It's now or never. I ain't gonna live forever. I just wanna live while I'm alive. It's my life. I'm gonna do what I wanna do because life is long and I wanna fill it with everything I possibly can. This is what, this is what our world thinks. That you're born and you live and you die and it's over. No wonder people do what they do. But that's just not true. You're going to live a lot longer after you're dead than you ever did while you were alive. No, here's how it works. Imagine this line being the line for eternity. And we know that the line doesn't start. And we know that the line doesn't end. So it's impossible to even illustrate this point. But somewhere on this timeline, we're born. We come into existence and we live this long, 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 long life and we get married and we have kids and we live through this and eventually, maybe 80 years later, we die. And everything is lived in between those clothespins. And we die and we live forever somewhere, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And most people live for this. And so when things get hard, they quit because they don't think that there's more after this. They have no perspective on eternity. And it bothers me, it fires me up to think about this. George Strait, great theologian, he writes, I ain't here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. 
So bring on the sunshine. To hell with the red wine. Pour me some moonshine. When I'm gone, put it in stone. He left nothing behind. I ain't here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. You know what I think about George Strait? He's an idiot. He's a moron. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's living everything for forever in this little bit of time. And he's going to pay for everything that he did. And we don't even think about it. This makes me crazy. This is why Paul can say, my light and momentary affliction is nothing compared to the all-surpassing glory that I have coming. So you can whip me, you can beat me, you can stone me, you can kill me. It won't matter because it's just this and I've got that to look forward to. How do we live our lives crucified? How do we live our lives like Jesus is saying? How can we possibly do that? By having an eternal perspective that we are going to live forever somewhere. And this, this right here, affects that. And you can waste this and regret that. I don't want that to happen. I beg you guys, don't let it happen. Don't waste your life with foolish pursuits. It's not going to matter in eternity. Oh, it will matter in eternity. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth can't get in to destroy it, where rust can't corrupt it, and where thieves can't steal it. Invest yourself in forever. You know how I do it? Because I know how my salvation came. Jesus Christ, he used this to purchase my that. He came to this earth to die on a cross for my sins. Every sin that I've ever committed was placed on him that day. And he died in my place. And he says, I purchased your forever. Now will you prepare for it? Will you stop wasting your life on meaningless things? Wood, hay, and straw? Start thinking about gold and silver and precious stones. I don't really know how else to end this except to go back to a song that we sang that I think is providential. He paid it all. How do you, how do you live for forever? You understand that it was purchased for you. I want us to go back and I want us to close with that song. So if you guys want to come back up. And uh, we'll sing this song. If you can't sing it, but you just want to listen to it, that's okay. But I want you to understand how much God loves you. That God is eternal. He thinks about eternal things. And he came to our time so that we could have eternity to spend with him. He paid it all for us. Let me pray for you. And then we're going to sing that song. And then I'll close this. Oh God, I just, uh, I want to take a minute. And I, I don't know. I don't know what was heard today. I pray, God, more than anything that they would know you love them. That you paid for their salvation. That you paid for their life. And the only response should be, okay, Lord, whatever you want, wherever you want, however long you want it, I want to give you my life in response to the grace that you've given to me. Lord, I pray for my friends here today who don't know you. I pray for them that they would be sensing that the Holy Spirit of God is working on their heart and they would simply surrender to you. That they would know that their righteousness is no righteousness at all. That they need yours. That they would believe in their heart that Jesus Christ died for them. That God raised them from the dead that they would believe that and that you would save them. And then you would help them to live for you beyond that. I just thank you, God, for saving me. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together, all right?
wants my heart more than he asks for my wage. One day I'll die, but it won't be my last day. When I look in his eyes. Sing how loud with all my mistakes, I still make him proud. He paid it all for me, carried that cross for you. On that rugged walk, he knew what he had to do. He opened his arms up wide, invited the world inside. With one final breath, he conquered death for me and for you.
God, I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts. I, I'm so conflicted because I, I, I do so believe in your grace. I do so believe that you purchased us and, and there's nothing that we can do to earn your favor. Nothing we can do and yet you've called us now beyond that to take that grace and to run with it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that. Give us a perspective, Lord. Help us to see the big picture, not just the little, little piece that we see. Lord, help us to think eternally. Help us to know that in a hundred years, this room is going to be full of a lot of other people. And we'll be gone. We'll be somewhere else. And will what we did with our life matter in eternity as far as how we respond to your grace? I pray, that, I pray God, that, that your spirit would fix anything that I've messed up this morning. That, Lord, we would help, that we would all see that it's grace-driven, it's not works-driven, but that it takes work. <laughs> oh, God, I pray that you'd bless these guys. I love them. I pray that you'd work in their lives this week. We love you, Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray that you'd call us to great things. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys.